like, when I came to Hollywood to work, it's just a dream. I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, all these people are in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> Some people dream of great accomplishments, while others stay awake and do them. Anonymous author. Our guest's first dream was to be a major league ball player and an actor. His high school coach felt that he shouldn't do both and called him a star. Actually, he did him a favor. Since then, he did not stop working to achieve his dream of being an actor. A wonderful career in Broadway, TV and films has proved that his coach wasn't wrong when he called him a star. <laughs> Bienvenido, Yancy. Hey, gracias, gracias. <laughs> so tell us a little about your training in acting and singing. Sure. Well, you, you know, you mentioned the baseball uh, uh, coach, and, and it was interesting because that high school was St. John's Prep in Astoria, Queens, and uh, the head of the music department and the theater, the musical theater uh, at that school, which they had a really nice program, was a man by the name of James R. Green. James Green is uh, no longer with us on this earth, but he's definitely an angel to all of us who he taught. And, uh, and his lesson, uh, he taught me how to sing. And from singing, he then brought me to a great acting coach called Jack Romano, and who is also uh, an angel with us. And uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, where uh, I still couldn't quite listen to my, my baseball coach. Okay. And then I, I joined the baseball team at Carnegie Mellon University, but then it was painfully obvious that I didn't have time for both because the university was like, choose baseball or drama or acting. And, and so I had to leave the baseball team then as well. <laughs> so um, two years at Carnegie Mellon then found my way into music theater on Broadway and I found a job in, in uh, the great show Miss Saigon. Um, and Miss Saigon embraced me for the next six years um, where I then found another mentor by the name of Alan Savage. And Alan Savage changed my life and he continued my studies and, and, and allowed me to find out who I am as a human being in all of these wonderful stories and lend my humanity to all of these wonderful stories that we pick up. So you mentioned Miss Saigon. Right. What means the Broadway musical Miss Saigon for your career? It was a, definitely a groundbreaking and changing, life-changing experience. It was, it was one of those things where I had trained for about eight years prior to getting that job and in, in, in those eight years I always dreamed of being on a Broadway stage. And I found, uh, I saw the show Les Miserables when I was about 17 years old, and I fell in love with that show. I fell in love with this amazing theater, the Broadway Theater on 53rd and Broadway. And I sat dead center, front row, watching Les Mis, and it broke my heart, and I was, in, I was just so engrossed by the play. And I said, someday, I'm going to work in this theater. I don't know if it's this show, but it'll be a show. And it happened to be Miss Saigon. And when I first got that job, and I sat in the back watching the whole show because they asked me to watch before I started rehearsing for the show. It blew me away and I was in tears again and obviously it was one of those experiences where you're just like, you're here. Then from there, I was able to cross over into television. Uh, my first two jobs was a show called, a movie called uh, Innocent Blood and Criminal Justice. And both movies were shot in Pittsburgh while I was in college. That was just before uh, Miss Saigon. So that helped me kind of uh, also get me into television and film in New York. Now, 1995, and I decide, okay, I've done about now 12 shows on television while I was doing Miss Saigon. And now I want to open up even more, and I want to be, I, I, I just, at that point I said, I have to start playing lead roles to be considered seriously. Um, and I'm ready. You know, I felt that at that point, 1995, I really felt like I needed to do something spectacular um, and I wasn't always being offered those roles or I wasn't going up for those roles because everything that came into New York with those kinds of meaty roles were stuff that us actors in New York had to kind of like battle for the smaller parts, you know. Now, there's no small parts, only small actors. We understand that. 
but in order to grow in this business, you kind of just have to yeah. graduate just a little bit more every time, you know? So I decided to produce. And I produced my first feature called Destination Unknown, uh, directed by Nesta Miranda and written by Nesta Miranda. And he and I be went to high school together at St. John's Prep. Okay. So suddenly, certain things started just universally happening where I was like, it's meant to be. We have to make this movie together. And I was the lead of the film. The film won the Hamptons Film Festival in, two, in 1997. And after that, ABC uh, became very interested in me. And I started doing pilots for ABC for the next three or four years. So, so one question, because you're talking that you were doing, you were working in TV almost at the same time that you started to work on theater. Yes. And we know that in TV shows, we don't have the same amount of uh, time to work a character as we do in right, theater. Right. How was the transition from Broadway to TV shows? It was a fantastic blur. <laughs> <laughs> I was on set from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. on any given show or my movie that I was producing. <clears throat> And I had to be on stage at 7.30 wow. in, my, in my, my room, uh, ready to, get, to be in, on stage at 8 p.m. And that was my schedule for four years. And the great thing is that as, as an actor, you find that if you have the time, you make the time to dive into these people. And then remember, going back to my love for history, research is huge. You know, so any character that I've played, I've always took the time to research and break down and understand the human being that I'm representing. So I just tell stories. Put me wherever you want. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's theater, TV, or whatever yeah, it is. Even exactly. in the park, exactly. you want to tell that story. And it's, uh, as an actor, you need to do your job. Exactly. You must be shapeless, formless, like water. When you pour water in a cup, it becomes the cup. When you pour water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. When you pour water in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can drip and it can crash. Become like water, my friend. Bruce Lee, American martial artist and actor. I hate television. I hate it as much as peanuts, but I can stop eating peanuts. <laughs> Orson Welles. American actor, director, and writer. 99% of the households in America possesses at least one television, and Americans spend at least 35 hours a week watching TV. Your face is very familiar to a lot of Americans because of your amazing uh, career in TV. Talk to me about American Family and uh, Kingpin. Well, American Family... Uh it was a great experience. I played the son of Edward James almost in the story American Family. Um, Gregory Nava directed and wrote it and, uh, along with his partner. And there was a fantastic synergy and a fantastic collection of wonderful actors from film and television that I got a chance to play brothers and sisters with. And, and it, it, it was like, I felt like I arrived in Los Angeles when I played uh, that role and, and I was involved in that show um, because these are people that I grew up watching and Kingpin was the the show that helped me get that role um, and other roles that I continued to get after. Uh, Kingpin came to me in one of those very serendipitous ways that um, the creators of the show knew of me uh, but they didn't bring me in right away for a very simple kind of weird thing. Uh, I had done a show called Charmed for mm -hmm. the spelling company, and uh, I just came off a movie called Time Machine that they shaved my head oh. completely because they wanted me to be an indigenous person 300,000 years in the future. So what happens? Then uh, they hired me on Charmed, and I have a, v a very close shave on my head, and so the spelling people thought I didn't have hair. Oh. So I, I didn't get a chance to audition for the show uh, until the very end when they were desperate to find the guy. Apparently there was an actor who couldn't speak any English and then they couldn't go with him. They came to me on the final day and said, you have hair. It grew. What's going on? Yes, I have hair. I'm only 30-something. What are you talking about? Yeah, okay, great. Um, you got the part. <laughs> and so I jump on the show and I have literally one week to prep for this show. 
And I drove down to Mexico and I met some people that I felt were integral in the world of, you know, uh, the, uh, the politics and the cartels. And I understood that there, this is an, an impossible war to win, the, the drug war. Uh, so I wanted to bring as much as I could in one week before shooting the pilot of Kingpin uh, that it, it had a certain uh, elegance and a certain intelligence and a certain know-how about how the system works. You know, it was very, very traffic-like. You remember Traffic, the movie Soderbergh yeah. directed? It was very much like that. David Mills, the creator, and Alan uh, Coulter, who directed the, the pilot episode, uh, the two of them took me under their wings and gave me the very best that they could to prepare me for this role in a week and continually uh, throughout the show. And uh, we became great friends. And they went on to do wonderful projects like Treme um, and Alan Coulter. D it does amazing shows like uh, Boardwalk Empire. You know, um, uh, and, and just to have worked with those greats, uh, it was an amazing, humbling experience. And so from there, that's how American Family and all they were the show that's, that I've been in since 2003, when that show came out. Uh, till today, 2014. So. What was Thief and who was Gabriel Williams? Thief was a fantastic show that should have got, again, like Kingpin, only got six episodes. This show got six episodes. And mind you, we had a great audience for both. Um, but it was just one of those kind of edgy underworld things that, you know, um, I guess certain reasons why you, didn't, you just don't know, like what, why doesn't stay on the air. It's interesting, great characters. Andre Brower uh, mm -hmm. won the Emmy that year, should have stayed. Uh, Gabriel, uh, that character was a fun kind of uh, thief, very much like the guys from Ocean Eleven, another Soderbergh type, you know, uh, show that, you know, we, uh, that we tried to do in Louisiana. Um, fantastic crew, uh, 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 Malik Yoba, who I'm currently working with on a, on a movie that I'm producing cur currently called Restored Me. Uh, we met and became the best friends. Actually, we met in New York undercover in New York, and we worked together there briefly, but uh, we just stayed great friends ever since. Uh, the HBO movie Walk Out earned you an outstanding supporting actor, mm -hmm. television series, miniseries, or television movie, Alma Award nomination. Mm -hmm. What do you think was was the most important thing about this movie and about your character, Panfilo Crisostomo? Another film directed by Edward James Olmos. Uh, and I was, uh, again, honored and humbled that he would ask me to come on board for this film uh, after doing American Family with him. Um, and immediately I, I took on the responsibility to play a Filipino uh, 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 person who, who was the father of the main... Uh, character played by Alexa Vega and she uh, she did a fantastic job playing the young girl um, that was fighting for the rights of, of, of her fellow students and I played her dad and I, I, I played the antagonist of the film in the way that like I just didn't want my daughter to get herself in so much trouble that she might get hurt by the officials and by the by the police and so that was a really moving story that I know still exists in high schools and colleges in terms of like showing the kids that this is the kind of uh, uh, history that Latinos had to go through in order to have a better life. Without a sense of identity, there can be no real struggle. Paolo Freire, Brazilian educator and philosopher. There's no substitute for hard work, 23 or 24 hours a day. And there's no substitute for patience and acceptance. Cesar Chavez, American civil rights activist. If someone knows about hard work, that is Jan C. Arias. Your name is part of the cast of at least four or five new movies. Talk to me about Chavez. Well, Chavez being an historic event uh, is, is such an honor and a privilege to have been a part of in the way that uh, there were so many important people on the team uh, uh, of organizers that went after the growers and the people that were abusing the farmers back in the 40s and 50s, even earlier than that. But in the 60s and 70s, it was Cesar Chavez who spearheaded the cause with the U United Farm Workers. And I played one of the organizers that was right there with him, Gilbert Padilla, 
along with uh, Dolores Huertas and Richard Padilla and Larry Leon, and the list goes on, uh, uh, lawyers and, 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 and all these wonderful people that uh, became uh, uh, so integral in helping out the human rights uh, issues that were uh, going on during that time. And uh, the, the farmers uh, were being abused. There were kids eight years old that should have been in school. They were in the, in, you know, in the, in the fields picking grapes and cotton, etc. Um, the story is intense, and it's, it's, it's a really great story about a true American hero. In Hand of Stone, you play Benny Huertas, a boxer. Mm. How did you prepare for this character? Well, you know, I, I, I studied martial arts since I was a little kid. I love martial arts. It's a part of my, uh, my whole being. It's a whole part of my existence. It's just, it's just a way of life. And, uh, you know, um, all the rules are applicable in, in acting to martial arts. A friend of mine said to me, I'm doing a historic mo historical movie about uh, Roberto Duran, the famous boxer, uh, hands of stone, manos okay. de piedra, and I was like, "Wow, my father was a fan of Roberto Duran, so I would love to be a part of this." So I spoke to my friend. I said, "Listen, I've done martial arts all my life. You know, I could pick up boxing. I, I would love to be in your film." He says, "Well, boxing's a different animal." I was like, "Yeah, it is." Well, um, how about this? In a week's time, come to the gym. I know a boxing uh, gym, uh, Pullman's in Burbank. Uh, great group of guys. I'm going to train with them for a week just to give me a little bit of unboxing and then you put me on tape and we'll see how it goes. In a week's time I was able to manage to understand the concept of that animal of boxing. Uh, I then trained for six months in boxing strictly. I didn't do any martial arts during that time except for boxing and we shot it in December of this past year 2013. Uh, my scene was the scene against Roberto Duran, or the fight against Roberto Duran, his first fight in 1971 at Madison Square Garden. Ever in America, Roberto shows up to America and knocks out my character, Benny Huertas, yeah. who was supposed to be this really tough fighter. And, and Robert De Niro, was, uh, who plays uh, Edgar Ramirez, his coach, well, Edgar Ramirez plays Roberto Duran. Yeah. And so uh, uh, Robert De Niro plays his coach and then discovers Roberto Duran's talent for the first time in the United States. And I get to be a part of that, you know, revelation. Nice. <laughs> and he yeah. knocks my character out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Producing is nothing new for you because you co-produced Destination Unknown right. early in your career. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Baby and the Shooting Star Salesman okay. and your new project. Yeah, restored me. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 2010, the same little bug hit me in the, in, the, in, in the gut in terms of stories to tell that we don't always get to tell from a Latino perspective. I, I really wanted to focus on universal stories that affect everyone and completely ignore the color of our skin, you know, but give over to our souls telling stories, no matter what, from the inside out. Um, and so this story about Baby was about a couple who were was going through some fertility issues, which happens to be... Uh, a problem for five million couples every year in this country, just this country alone, not even including the rest of the world. It could be a, ten times that. But so I, I said, this is a very comical and a very uh, dramatic type of situation. So I, I wrote and directed a dramedy about this kind of experience. Um, my wife and I are having a baby this coming May 27, 2014. Congratulations. I Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and I did that movie in 2010. When we were thinking about having a baby in our, our, our marriage and bringing a child to this world, I realized, you know, I, I have to look into why after so many years being married to my wife that we didn't get pregnant. So you have to do the, vic the, 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 the visitors to the, to the doctors and understand. And when I did the visits and the tests, I was like, what? This is crazy. You know, and so, but, but I met a wonderful doctor who, who showed me the way, that there was hope and for, for a couple like us. And so I had to write about it and I had to direct a story about it. And I had to just kind of like, you know, explore what that meant for us, you know. Um, and my wife played the lead role and I had a wonderful actor, a great friend of mine from the show Thief,
to play the lead uh, uh, by the name of Crane Cro Clayne Crawford. Clayne Crawford played the lead in Baby, uh, along with my wife, Anna mm -hmm. Carolina Alvim. And they did a spectacular job, and we won several awards with that film. Um, because it touched home to so many couples that were dealing with the same issue. This movie ultimately helped a lot of couples understand that there's, there's hope and there's a way with great doctors and the ability to, to co-create with God uh, a way to have a family. And now begins the biggest journey of my life to be a dad, <laughs> to a little boy, <laughs> and to a man someday, and I hope to still obviously be here for this man, to be him. And, and he will uh, watch the movie. And he will watch the movie and see what inspired us to have him. <laughs> Or other kids, who knows, we might have more. And yeah. currently, uh, I'm producing a, and, and starring in a film called Restored Me, which uh, it reaches out to the community in the way that it talks about uh, basically forgiveness and uh, redemption. And those themes are important in terms of our community, in terms of understanding like who we are, understanding to forgive yourself for things that you may or may not have done, and to restore yourself way past uh, a, a time that was, uh, that was inflicted on you, uh, that you can actually survive that. There, again, a, another film about hope and, and trying to, to, to get those kids out there to understand that there's, there's a way out of the life that may seem impossible. Looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> Gracias, Jancy. <laughs> True happiness comes from the joy of deeds well done, the zest of creating things new. Antoine de saint exupéry French writer. Thanks for watching us and see you next week on the Indie Scene.